Jeff Nicholson. Jeff Nicholson, I've actually known Jeff, um, you know, the first, let's put it this way, the first time I met Jeff, I, I'm sort of trying to work it out. Was you were a child, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, I was a child. It was possibly in 1984. I'm not absolutely certain, but uh, Jeff wrote um, a, an incredible novel called Street Sleeper, and it was published by an outfit called Quartet, and um, uh, and uh, it, it was a cracking story. And um, uh, I I worked for another publisher called Hodder and Stoughton at the time, and and we. Uh, somehow uh, muscled Jeff away from Quartet. And I think we published, what, the next three novels? But yeah, uh, the novel I remember was a, a novel called The Knock Garden. And I met Jeff in a, uh, upstairs in a pub in uh, Newman Street. And um, I can't remember very much about the evening, and thankfully neither can he. And um, ever since then, I've sort of been interested in what Jeff gets up to us. And then 10 years ago, he, he wrote this um, a book about walking, and that's my kind of passion. And he wrote a book called The Lost Art of Walking. Um, and uh, behind that, he'd written 10 or 12 novels. Um, so, you know, he's, uh, he's a man who writes in the novel form. He writes long bits of writing, not this kind of short stuff that we're asking people to, to write in our writing competitions. Um, so I, I actually got hold of uh, Jeff while he was living in Hollywood at the time, and we did one of these uh, uh, over the internet interviews on Skype, and I recorded that and I published it for Talking Walking. And then he wrote another book called Walking in Ruins. Um, so he's been uh, writing nonfiction about walking for some time. And we're going to talk this evening about uh, his latest book, uh, which is called The Suburbanist. Um, and I'm going to ask Jeff to explain that a little bit in a minute. But he's also got a, 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 another book, um, and this is a kind of an interesting story behind it. It's called uh, Walking on Thin Air, and it's not yet published. And here you have someone, Jeff, who's got uh, 20 uh, or more books behind him, um, many of them very successful, uh, is still finding it tough to persuade publishers uh, to publish a book about walking. So um, maybe we'll explore that a bit, but he's uh, looking for backers on Unbound. So uh, if there's a chance that you've got a few spare euros in your pocket, then please pop them uh, towards Jeff's Unbound. Yeah, crowdfunding is the word we're looking for. Crowdfunding, excellent. Okay, so um, Jeff, uh, let us know a little bit about the suburbanist. What okay. Well, it, um, it it looks like this, um, and it's a book about um, the history and the nature um, of the suburbs, and what we mean by suburbs, and why so many people hate the suburbs, um, and where the word comes from, and where the idea comes from and who has designed suburbs, both here and in the States. They're the two things I know most about, but I also talk slightly about other places, including Japan. Um, so there is this sort of, I mean, I, I'm by no stretch of the imagination an academic, but you know, I'm, I guess I'm bookish, so that when I start researching, you know, that there's, a, there's an element of boots on the ground which there is in the suburbanist, and there's also long days spent in the uh, British Library. Um, and I think that, and in, in, in a lot of ways, it's a book I've been thinking about in one form or another uh, for a very long time, because I, I mean, somewhere along the line, um, maybe quite recently, but not that recently, I, I realized that I spent most of my life living in some form of suburbia. Um, I was born in Sheffield. Um, my parents lived in a council house until I was about 15, 16. And, you know, they, the, the kind of council house, the kind of council estate that we lived in, you know, there were little houses, little rows of twos and threes with a garden at the front and the garden at the back, and some of them had garages. Uh, and if that's not suburbia, I don't know, I don't know what it is. Um, and my, just before uh, Margaret Thatcher started the right to buy, my dad, uh, we were having trouble with one of the neighbours, and my dad thought it was time to, you know, 
move out of the council estate uh, into quote unquote suburbia. And so, you know, I say he was slightly ahead of the game, but not very much ahead of the game. You know, ordinary working class people were starting to buy their own homes. Um, and they bought a little semi in, uh, in a place called Gleedless, uh, above the snow line in Sheffield. Um, and that means they lived there until they died. Um, and of course, when I was 17, 18, I couldn't imagine anything worse than having a, a semi-detached house and having a garden that you had to mow and weed and take care of. Um, and, you know, for a long period, I lived in London in various horrible little flats. And then somewhere along the line, you know, you kind of think, well, you know, maybe living in a little house with a garden front and back in suburbia wouldn't be so terrible after all. Um, and then I ended up in the States. I ended up in living uh, for about 15 years in, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and as you said earlier, in Hollywood. Um, you know, and by many, many markers, Los Angeles is the most suburban place on earth. You know, even the ghetto, you'll find, you know, you've got a, a chain link fence, but you've got, a, you've got a detached house, you've got a garden, you've got a garage, you've got a driveway. Um, and the particular bit of suburbia there in, in, that I lived in, in LA was, I, I used to call it the lower slopes of the Hollywood Hills. You know, all the, the, the rich folks lived up at the top of the hills, and we lived down at the bottom of the hills. Um, and, it, you know, it, 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 it wasn't exactly like um, well in Garden City, let's say. But, you know, there was space and there was air, there was health. Um, each house was a certain distance away from the adjoining house. Um, Many of the houses were uh, quote unquote unique, or at least they were different from their neighbors. Um, but you know, it was a very suburban existence. Um, and where this ties in with walking, uh, stop me if I'm rambling too much, is that you know, I've always enjoyed walking around suburbia um, and finding the, the weird little angles and the, the, the things that make one house slightly different from the next. Um, and, you know, what people decide to put in their garden, you know, why they decide to have, you know, a certain kind of, you know, why, why they have a certain kind of front door rather than another, uh, you know, which houses have their uh, extensions, which have the conservatories. Um, and that sort of, the way that people can express themselves in very small ways within an overall notion of conformity, um, you know, I find infinitely fascinating. Um, and at the moment, I'm living in, well, I'm in Essex, in a place called Lawford Dale, which is about, which nobody's ever heard of, but Manningtree is the nearest town. Um, we're about an hour away from London. And, um, yeah, I'm here. I've got a little garden front and back. The thing I live in is actually called, according to the developer, uh, and you can always trust a developer, of course, is called a, a chalet bungalow. But it doesn't seem to me that it's either a chalet or a bungalow, but it's got two, 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 two three rooms downstairs and one and a half upstairs. And um, it suits me very nicely at the moment. And, you know, and I, and I go out and walk. Well, what I found when I read the book was it was clear that you'd done a huge amount of research and a lot of that on foot, um, because as you say, yeah. you, you, you bought it. But what you didn't, I mean, what, what's interesting is that um, uh, we, we often find that walkers sort of fall into two camps. They're either urban walkers or they're, they're country walkers. And yet um, I think you're, you've, you're, you've sort of started to steal a march on suburban walking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I, I am more of a, a, an urban walker than a, than a country walker, um, and yeah, I would say the suburb is somewhere between between the urban and the, and the rural. Um, people don't. People look at you a bit funny sometimes, you know, as a as an explorer of, of suburbia, especially if you're taking pictures. People don't like to have you take pictures of their driveways or their their front gardens, although some do. I mean, you know, my my 
my tech my technique was always to say oh that's a nice garden well, let's talk about it um, as, as a way of diffusing any kind of uh, hostility though I mean it didn't it didn't absolutely always work um, did, did, did you often encounter people or did you actually find the suburbs were fairly deserted of people no, I mean, if, yeah I mean if you went to the suburbs in the middle of the day you know you were very hard pressed to, to find anybody on the streets at all I mean, and I suppose it would be probably even more deserted if you went there at night. Um, yeah, I mean, it's exactly what I mean. You know, not not all the cliches about the suburbs are untrue. You know, people. Well, I, I did quite most of the research of the book was, or at least fifty percent was done before COVID. So if people were not working from home. People were going to you know, were going to work. So you did tend to find the suburbs deserted. Um, I, I did a bookshop event uh, last week. Um, in Crystal Palace, and the guy who ran the bookshop there said that the um, COVID working from home had been fantastic for him because he's in the little um, the, the little high street there in his bit of Crystal Palace, and that you know people went out for a walk at lunchtime in suburbia. I mean, when I used to work in central London, you know, lunch times were just yeah, that was my hour of freedom. And I'd walk as far as, as far as I could away from where I worked, but to make sure that I could get back. But that lunchtime walk, especially in a city, is you know is what keeps us as city workers sane. But it was interesting that this and you know and the people who are working from home, even in you know quote unquote suburbia, they needed to get out and do that um, and you know, and do that walking. And of course, it's now government, or I'm not sure it is anymore. But there was that period, wasn't there, where we were allowed to do our, our one hour a day, um, was it, well, something exercise, mandatory exercise, or permitted exercise. Well, look, well I've always thought, of, uh, you know, writing about walking is actually really tough because there's not a lot you can say about walking, but there's an awful lot about what, uh, all the people you meet and what well, you observe, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, a, a, a large part of me does enjoy walking for the sake of it, but yeah, I mean, it's a, what should I say, it's a discipline, you know, you, as a writer, you look, you observe, you you, you make note of things. Um, well, I was going to ask, you, do you make notes while you go along, or do you, do you use the camera as an aid memoir? Yeah, something? I mean, increasingly, um, like everybody else, I, you know, tend to take pictures as I go. Um, I can't. I mean, sometimes you know, I will actually make a note. I mean, if I do meet somebody and we have a very quick exchange, and it's particularly poignant, um, you know, when, when I'm finished with them, I may you know, jot down what we said just as a, you know, as you say, as an Ed memoir. But um, I'm not as great a note taker as uh, you know as, as some people. Uh, I mean, I have endless notebooks, and most of them are full of jottings that I don't understand anymore. You know, I, yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes there'll be a notebook, and it's nice, and there's only been one page that's been written on, and I've written one sentence, and I don't know what I meant by it, or you know what it refers to, or why I wrote it down. But um, that's so, so. So when did the writer in Jeff emerge? Where, when, 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 what were the kind of early days? What? When was the early day? <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, I suppose, and I suppose all kids write at school, don't they? You're, you're encouraged to write at school, and um, I was encouraged, you know, I, I was quote unquote good at it. Um, and um, I mean, I wrote my first novel when I was 11. It was a uh, James Bond pastiche. Um, and, you know, I did I? I mean, I suppose I was always, yeah, I was always writing stuff. Um, you know, it didn't seem a particularly eccentric thing to do. And, you know, my, my fellow schoolboys didn't think it was particularly eccentric. Um, occasionally, you know, one of the teachers would, would take note of the fact that I was writing, but it wasn't, you know, it didn't feel like an ambition. Um, but then when I got into my teens, um, I sort of discovered, I mean, I was always writing, I was always reading novels, but when I was in my teens, I, I kind of discovered theatre. 
Um, you know, and it was a good time to discover theatre because you, 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 know, you had the Theatre of the Absurd and Pinter and Beckett and uh, Tom Stoppard. And I just found something incredibly um, moving and persuasive and, I mean, and thrilling about sitting in a room with actors and hearing live actors speak and, and move and act. Um, and of course, you know, it doesn't take much to work out. Well, you know, somebody's at, they're not making it up as they go along. They are, that, you know, some guy wrote this stuff. Um, and I think that was probably the, the first ambition that I had, the first serious ambition. Um, and at university, there was a very active student drama group um and i had i had plays on at, among them it was, at, it was at cambridge and we went to you know a couple of those plays went up to the edinburgh festival um and then after university i moved to london and you know i i had a very small amount of quote-unquote success um on the fringe the london fringe because fringe theater was you know we forget but people were kind of excited. People would go to lunchtime theatre, you know, they'd, they'd go to see a play, um, and uh, you know, in their lunch hour. And I, I really, I thought that's where I was going. You know, I had a really good agent, um, and I thought I was, I thought that's where I would go. And eventually, I got to the point where. I was still getting plays on in these very, very small venues around London, you know, generally in uh, rooms above pubs. And suddenly one day, you know, you kind of realise, you know, I've put all this work in, the actors were good, you know, professional or semi-professional. Um, and there would be 10 people in the audience, uh, you know, and nine of them were, were personal friends, either of me or the cast. Uh, and that didn't seem to be um, entirely the way forward. Um, but I, I've always, I mean, we, <laughs> the thing you haven't said, and I probably haven't said, is that there is always some humour in, in, in what I do. Although, um, you know, you were talking about Bleeding London, which has a, a thriller plot. There's always a kind of rough, uh, Yeah, I was, I was, was going to say that it's the, it's the slant that you take that makes your read. I mean, I've read lots of books about suburbia because um, I, you know, I'm an urban designer, an urban planner. Mm. So uh, I, I thought, gosh, you know, I can't believe it. This chap is actually researching and reading books that I have on my on my shelves, many of which I have never opened. Well, I was going to say, I, did you feel that I had, uh, I was encroaching yeah, on your territory? Yeah, I, well, I got the impression at least you'd read them. Uh, <laughs> I, I haven't done that. But the other thing is that um, uh, it, it's so much better and much more uh, engaging to read someone who writes uh, in the way that you do uh, than it is to read these sort of academic texts. And what I was going to say is that most people who study suburbia are are, are academics. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, there, there aren't that many people, are, you know, uh, sort of writing about uh, suburban milieu. I mean, they might be including it as a backdrop to their novels, but. Uh, not not beyond that, but perhaps can I just sort of get you to tell us a little bit about how did you you know uh, uh, how do you actually write now? I mean, you know, are you you have you got one too many novels in your head? I mean, uh, to write a novel takes a uh, yeah, it's a discipline, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, I've probably got about three too many novels in my head, but um, you know, I mean, I'm working on one at the moment. Um, and I guess we're all, all, always with, with nonfiction. You have a, a, a reasonable idea of where you're going. You know, you, you can, you know, you can make a list of the topics and the chapters, yeah. and you say, well, yeah, I'm going to write about you know, early suburbia and American suburbia and movies set in suburbia or novels set in suburbia. But with a novel, you know. You set out, and you know, to, to use the the walking metaphor, you know, you know what direction you're going in, but you don't know where you're going to end up, and you don't know what you're going to see along the way. Um, um, it seems to me that it's a what is it? I mean, it's you know, I started out as a student of literature, 
for want of a better word. And, you know, it was those, some of those early American, you know, on the road type novels. They were the ones, that, and, you know, William Burroughs and Thomas Pynchon. They were the guys who really sort of stirred me up. And I don't think I've ever read any nonfiction book that's had that kind of effect on me. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it can. and I'm sure there are people for, for whom it does. But, uh, you know, and I've got a bit of a cloth here for poetry, I've got to say. Um, but the novel strikes me as, you know, the thing I like best and the thing that, well, I mean, I think the thing that, you know, um, is sort of the, 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 the pinnacle of, of what literature is for me. I mean, I say other views are possible. I'm sure some would say poetry and some would say drama, but yeah, for me, it's, it's always the novel fiction. And are you incredibly disciplined in your writing? Do you, do you get up and so do you want to five or, uh, you know, or, or you, you work in the morning and then go and play golf? I don't, I don't think you do. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'm trying to fit in a walk every day, but um, I mean, I'm, I'm not bad. I mean, I'm probably not as disciplined as I used to be, in fact. And a lot depends on what stage you're, I'm at with a book. You know, there's the book kind of determines how you how you work on it. But I like to try to be a, a nine to fiver. Um, you know, in the early days when you haven't written that much, you know, and there's lots of room to 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 write and to explore and and to get words down that that's sort of the easy bit um and then you know the, oh then, and then and then there's the endless editing you know and moving things around and you know crossing it out getting rid of it and then you know a week later you think, oh i shouldn't have got rid of that and then you you, you bring it back and um and that's that's kind of the stage i'm at with the novel i'm working on at the moment there was one whole chunk that I got rid of today, and I mean, it still exists. But I think, you know, even even if it belongs in the novel, it doesn't belong there. You know, it belongs somewhere else. Um, I mean, that's, I mean, I, can't, and I wouldn't say that's the fun bit, but that's, you know, that's the job. That's what you, that's why you're, that's what a writer's in business to do. No, okay. Well, no, I, I'm, you know, I'm just wondering whether there's anyone in the room that wants to uh, think up a question and ask a question. I know uh, uh, Bob's got a question uh, about uh, his uh, experience of living in Hollywood. Uh, Bob, far away, if you want to ask the question. Can I see Bob? Yeah, he's uh, he's he's there, but he's not his audio on. Bob, you got I'm trying. Oh yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Oh, cool. Yeah. <clears throat> I I'd lived on the east side, East Hollywood, a Los Feliz, round by Griffith Park there, and I used to go for a, a a run through the park right up to the observatory every every Saturday, and very much that experience of going by all the little houses, as you say, exactly as you say, a little different, a little bungalow with their own dog, barking dog, and everything in the garden, and I it's something to do with the mixture of that and Hollywood. I did an MA in modern English and American literature, you know, before I went out. And there's something to do with, and I studied with Lee Strasberg, I studied, uh, not acted, but there's something, almost it's in the air in Hollywood, that, that somehow in a, a, advance, like the Pacific Coast isn't the, isn't the East Coast of America, it's kind of a, a different stratosphere to the rest of America almost. and. Uh, it's, uh, there's something almost because it's Hollywood land, you know, the land of fantasy and imagination. It's almost look like walking in a liquid space. <laughs> so the process of walking, well, and I call it the process of walking. It's almost a process that 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 that, that puts you into a mental. I called it a psycho um, mood almost. I don't know if does any of that those sort of thinking does that resonate at all with anything you recognise. Well, I mean, first of all, that's exactly where, that's pretty much where I lived. I lived very close to Griffith Park off, off Los Feliz Boulevard. So we, we wow. would have been neighbours. I don't know, I don't know if we were there at the same I, time. I was, I was there 72 we... to two. Oh no, you, you, were, you were. I was on Hazel Kirk Drive in, in that's right, that's you were, you, yeah, you were long gone by the time I arrived. Um, yeah. I mean, of course, one of the things is that 
Yeah, there's this um, cliche that nobody walks in LA. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, as someone from London, yeah, me and you. you know, you always think, yeah, I'm going to be different from everybody else. I'm going to do some walking. But once you get there, you find there are lots of other people who have the same attitude, who are, you know, who are trying to undercut the cliche as well. So, I mean, if you're a walker there, you tend to find other walkers. Um, I mean, I was happy enough to walk on my own, but I certainly found walking companions. Um, I mean, when I first got there, I mean, it just seemed like a complete fantasy land, you know, of of the architecture, the cars, um, the flora. Um, and, you know, it never quite got old. It never got stale. It always seemed odd. It always seemed a bit strange. Um, yeah. And it never became, you know, business as usual. Um, whether it would be the same for people who were born there, I, I don't think it isn't. I think people, I think LA people are well aware of, you know, the kind of fantasy land in which they live. It's kind of hyper real in a way. That's the only word I can use. But of course, I mean, it looks fantastic. You know, the sun and the, the blue sky and the ocean and the palm trees. But certainly, Bob, there's a whole, um, you know, um, uh, echelons of people writing about the psychogeography of places. So uh, that's very much this sort of sensorial experience of uh, uh, of different places. And I, I know that Jeff has already sort of um, said to me uh, off record or before we had this meeting, he said that, well, you, you know, pretty much everything that can be written in a sort of psychogeographical way has probably been, been written. Um, um, so I thought maybe uh, uh, because maybe. Jeff has spent a long time today. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, uh, now that you, now that you bring it up, I'm sure that's not true. I mean, there's always going to be. Another, well, what I was going to say is that Jeff spent a long time tidying his uh, his office today because he's uh, put a pile of books to his right, and I'm not sure whether anyone can see them in the in the background. But uh, I'm going to ask him uh, the question, which is. Uh, of the writers who've written about walking, Jeff, which are the ones that have inspired you, or which are the ones that uh, uh, drive you insane? Well, uh, I, mean, this is a, it, I mean, it's not an entirely random selection, but it's... Ah, but, I mean, that's it's, what I wanted to ask you about, Jeff. You know, how did you carefully curate these? I know, you know, when we're going on video conferencing, my books are totally randomly uncoordinated here, but I mean, I know, you know, we've all got to carefully curate our books. I've been looking at that pile <laughs> with fascination. And the only one I could read was Ian Sinclair's Last London, which is great. I've read it, but I mean, yeah. I hope I'm really pleased you're going to tell us about the rest. So thank you. Well, as you, I mean, the one you're talking about, yeah, is the, la the last. The when I look at myself, the, the, the writing is left to right reversed. Is it when you see it? No, it's proper now. No. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, Ian Sinclair was um, very early on. It, um, Andrew was talking about my novel, Bleeding London, um, which came out in 1997. And I did a launch event at um, one, of the, one of the books in, uh, one of the bookshops in Charing Cross Road. And I did a reading alongside um, Ian Sinclair. And I'd never heard of him then and had never read anything. But the book he was selling was Lights Out for the Territory. And that, I guess, was his, you know, his, his big breakthrough. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not a Sinclair completist, but I mean, I've read a lot. And yeah, oh, yeah, there he is. There's Andrew holding it up. Um, and yeah, I mean, he's still got that special place for, for any of us who like to walk and, you know, in cities and explore sort of the deep history of of the city and, and what it's like to walk. Um, I mean, in a far more intense way, I guess, than, than I do. Um, I mean, and... I mean, these, these, uh, they're, I'm not, they're, they're, I can't really get a pattern between them. Uh, this is, this is Werner Herzog's, um, of walking in ice, which, um, I mean, the story was that, um, he was in Paris 
Uh, he, he, his friend Lottie Eisner, who's a, a film editor, is in Paris, uh, apparently likely to die. And he decides that if he walks from Munich to Paris, she will live. So he walks to Paris and in fact, he lives around another 10 years. So it so it works. But of course, it's got that, you know, it's everything you I mean, if you like Werner Herzog movies, then, you know, th this is sort of the literary equivalent, the, 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 the written version, if you like. Um, this is a, a, a great book by, um, I don't even know how you pronounce him, Torbjorn Eckerland. Um, a book so great that it contains uh, an introduction by me. But I'm. In I mean, praise, of, in praise of what? We can only read as far as in praise of. In, in, praise, in praise of paths. Paths. Thank you. Well, I do it back there. Um, and he's a, he's, a, he's a Norwegian. Um, and he's. He, He's got a very interesting range of references. They're not the same references that uh, that English people or American people have, and that's quite um, yeah that that that's sort of enlightening to me. Um, and although you won't, probably won't be able to see much on this, um, this is uh, by Sebastian Snow, who is one of these crazed Old Etonian explorers. You know, he was um, he wasn't allowed to play rugby at, at Eton because he got a bad leg. Um, so he then walked from uh, Tierra del Fuego. He planned to walk the whole length of of the Americas, but in fact, you know, gave up after about two thousand miles. Um, and you know, and he's sort of this great comic explorer. I mean, you know, he doesn't set out to be comic, but hilarious things happen to him. You know, he decides. You know, he he has contact lenses, and you know, if I was if I was doing a two thousand mile walk, I wouldn't wear contact lenses. And of course, they get stuck in his eye, and his toe gets bitten by a vampire bat. And it's you know, it's what we want from from walking books, isn't it? We don't want people just to walk around and have a pleasant time. We want we want terrible things to happen to them. Uh, I'm also quite keen on 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 Simon Armitage. There were there were the two books he wrote. Okay. Um, this one was the first one was Walking Home, um, you know about walking the, the Pennine Way, which is kind of the the territory that I know. I mean I'm, I'm from Sheffield, um, and the Pennines, you know, is right is right there. Um, if you're if you're a walker in Sheffield. Um, and, and we, I, my dad was a bit, you know, he and I used to go walking on Sunday mornings. You'd either, there he is again. Uh, you'd either go walking into the Peak District or into the Pennines, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's rough stuff. It's not easy walking or I, you know, or I didn't find it. Um, and the, the one I particularly wanted to kind of mention was um, Lauren Elkin, The Flaneurs, which is about women who do the kind of thing we're talking about and the difficult well yeah i mean you're the, the gen that's uh you should you should have a chapter but about how you know how it's different for women and how um you know historically and for reasons of safety and what what women were supposed to to do and how they were really? supposed what to... are women supposed to do then jeff we're supposed to stay at home and be good wives oh thank you <laughs> Um, and that's, I don't know, and I've also got here the, uh, you know, the Art of Walking, which is a collection of sort of avant-garde, um, experimental walking, if you like, um, art walkers. Um, well, that's that, that 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 gets me to the bottom of my pile. So, uh, Good. but of course, I'm looking at Jen. I'm looking at your books there. And I... Oh no, they're not my real books. Um, which books are they? I've got. That's the random books that aren't on the real bookshelves that are around the corner, which I think include quite a lot of your books, actually, Jeff. Well, of course. <laughs> of, of which there are quite a few. So uh, um, what I was going to say is, uh, uh, have we got any other questions from the audience? Uh, Jen, thank you for that. Um, uh, has anyone else got a question for Jeff at this stage? We're getting, you know, uh, we've got about 20 minutes left. We need about 10 minutes for that quiz. 
Um, uh, so, you know, if there's another question, do pitch it in. Otherwise, I'm, yeah. Bob, you've already spoken, but someone else? I, I had to, Gene. I've, I've got a question for Jeff. Yeah, please go ahead, Jason. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I, Jeff, I haven't read your book yet, but I just wanted to know, just generally. Oh, it's, it's, Jason. Hello, Jason. Yeah, I mean, we've been hiding because we were eating dinner. <laughs> Hello. Um, so my question is this. I mean, is, is suburbia a happy place? I know it's an average place, or is it, is it a, it's a conformist place? Is it a happy place? Is it, a, is it a, an average place? Or... Uh, I mean, I, I, I think it's a place like any other. Um, I mean, the notion that people, I mean, I, mean, I tried not to be too um, contrarian in the book. Because there's a whole there's a chapter in the book about the people who hate suburbia, and you know many have written a, a, a about it in abusive terms. Um, and I, you know, of course, my first inclination is to argue with people. Um, but one of the uh, cliches about uh, about suburbia is that everybody's very conservative, everybody's very conformist. Um, conservative with a small and a big C, and potentially racist, and they're little Englanders. Um, and I don't find, you know, I haven't done a poll of every of every suburbanite, but it seems to me you just find the same number, the same amount of prejudices and liberalities in suburbia as you do anywhere else. Certainly, as much as you would in. Uh, you know, in any district of London. Does that answer your question in any? Yeah, I mean, I, I was question successfully. I've been, I've been working on a project looking at the most average town in the UK and the most average town in Germany um, with a German photographer. And Didcot happens to be the, the most average town in the UK or in England. By, by, what, um, by what criteria? By the, by statistically, I think, you know, like how many how much you earn, how many people, you know. I'm, I'm not totally sure exactly how they judge it, but it's been done by statisticians. Um, yeah, well, well um, I don't know if this applies anymore, but once upon a time, when they used to uh, calculate the cost of living in England, they, uh, they used Bromley as the center of the cyclone, that that would be, you know, they would go into a supermarket and in Bromley, they would look at the, the cost of gas and electricity in Bromley. Uh, so, so Bromley was once upon a time a notion of averageness, but whether averageness and typicality are, are the same thing, I'm not sure. But are you spending a lot of time in Didcot? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so, no place. Oh. Sorry, uh, Andrew. Uh, oh, no, go ahead, Jeff. You were about to say. Uh, what, what, what I think I was going to say. I mean, I take it Didcot is a is a town. I mean, it's not yes, a suburb. It is a town, yeah. So it has it has its own suburbs, and this was, I mean, one of the questions about you know, how we define a suburb was that somewhere like uh, <laughs> Well in Garden City certainly doesn't think of itself. As, as very suburban, I mean, certainly it wouldn't have been thought that way by uh, Ebenezer Howard, who designed it and to some extent built it. But if somebody dropped you in the middle of Welling Garden City, you know, you would think you were in the suburbs. So the, the idea of an average city with average suburbs around it is um, is a fascinating one. I mean, I go through Didcot quite often, in fact, on my way to. I mean, it seems like a big suburb. It doesn't feel like the centre has much. Yeah. Centre. Uh, and there also think places like um, Croydon. You know, Croydon was a town. Well, I suppose it is a town, but it's now part of a London borough. So there's a cent there's a centre, the town centre of Croydon. Then you have the suburbs of Croydon. But increasingly, Croydon is also a suburb of London. And I mean, you know. One of the fears. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a hundred percent booster for the joys of suburbia, but one kind of imagines that everywhere in the south of England is in danger of turning into a suburb of of London. That between 
yeah, between Dover and uh, Coventry, it will all become a sort of suburban enclave that relies upon London for its existence. And that would be bad. Uh, Jeff, a couple of um, people have popped things in the... Uh, I've had a message from Adam saying that his uh, microphone uh, isn't working. Is that right, Adam, or can you speak to us? And No, I think the answer is poor old Adam is silenced. Um, <laughs> no, oh, no he, yeah. says, he, says, he says yes. Oh, good. Well, talk to us, Adam. No, it might be yes that it's not working. Oh, it could be yes it's not working. Um, do you want to, uh, have you, uh, no microphone. Okay, so um, ha have you come across uh, Nick Papam, oh gosh, how have you pronounced that name, Papam Mitrio? Uh, he wrote a book called Scar, I think. I, I'm surprised, um, yeah, I'm chagrined to find it's not here in my pile, but oh, yes. Right. I mean, Scarp is, a, Scarp is the one I is the one I've read. Yeah, and and I know that Nick and uh, and Will Self and Matthew Beaumont go for a walk on uh, on the twenty first of June every year, and they walk through the night together. But apart from that, you know, quirky quirky unknown fact about uh, Nick. But I I don't uh, I've read Scarp too. But um, um, what about Norman Mailer? Jeff, are you a fan of Norman Mailer? Uh, you're not allowed to be a fan of Norman Mailer anymore, are you? I don't think. I mean, you know, he, he is pretty un, unreconstructed. But I mean, I wasn't a big fan even when he when it was permissible. I mean, the ones who, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the two the two novelists who spring to, male novel male American novelists who spring to mind, who write about suburbia and who, you know, are, are currently have got a bad rep. Uh, would be John Updike and uh, and Philip Roth, and obviously suburban life. I mean, American East Coast suburban life kind of informs people, the way people live, their adulteries, their families, and you know, it got to me. That I read it when I was you know, young enough not to be um, not to be woke about it. Um, I mean, I did reread when I was writing the book. I did reread some Philip Roth, the early stuff, the uh, Goodbye Columbus, which is about um, Jewish suburbia, about you know, the Jews from Manhattan who were successful from New York, and, and they move into Long Island or um, yeah, let's say Long Island or New Jersey. Um, and it seems, and I don't know that he was, he was much criticised by the Jewish community. I mean, and today it seems it seems to me fine that you know it's a, it's an affectionate mockery, but you know if I was the one being mocked, uh, I might feel differently, as as indeed did the people at the time. Well, once again, thanks very much, everyone, for taking part. Thank you very much, uh, especially to Jeff Nicholson. And Jeff, you have the last word. Oh dear. Um, keep on walking. There you are. Keep on walking. Okay, well, good luck, everybody. And, uh, and happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Yeah. Thank All you. Good.